I am lopsided because I cannot see out of my left eye. I just had to take my contact out just a bit because I'm going one contact. I don't know if I look funny, but y'all look hilarious. <laughs> um, really, you don't. I just can't see you. Interestingly enough, I, I run in the restroom a minute ago, and I'm trying to get this fixed. I've been doing it all morning long, and I don't know if I've just got to cut in the contact or what. But I'm thinking about the lesson, and I'm thinking about what I'm dealing with in my eye, and I'm going... Man, we go through negative and difficult and bad situations all the time, and that's where I want to go with you today and how we've got to find the positive <laughs> in those bad situations. So I'm in the restroom a minute ago, and I'm thinking, Lord, where's the positive in this? I've got to be able to speak this morning, and obviously I can still speak, and I guess the positive is I still have another contact. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. You're going to go through difficult times in this life. But I wonder, my question is this, do we find the positives in the midst of the negative situation? Do we even look for the positives? Or do we develop the bad attitude and never think about potential positives in the midst of a possibly, potentially tragic situation. I remember when my dad had his stroke in 98 and that was a bad situation. That was definitely a negative point in our lives. But when I look back, the positive in that is that sometime later he was baptized into Christ. Now would he have been baptized had he, had he not had the stroke? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I know that he was baptized and there was a positive in that. Maybe the positive in the midst of your negative time is that it's, it's brought you closer to God. Maybe your relationship is stronger. Maybe you're a better parent. Maybe you're a better friend. Maybe you're a better Christian. We can always find positives in the midst of negative situations. The question is, do we look for them? So I want to turn to Acts 15. I want you to go there with me. Glad I changed to the big print Bible. Acts 15. And this was a potentially negative situation for Paul and Barnabas. And what we want to do, or what I want to do this morning, is look at something that probably you're, you're familiar with. You've read this little story. You, you've read the text. You know what happens. But how many times have you gone through it and said, well, I just want to draw the positives out. I just want to find the good in this negative situation between Paul and Barnabas. Well, let's read the story in Acts 15, starting in verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark and with him and, and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord and went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches." So Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are sent out by the, by the church to, to do the, go on this first missionary journey where they're planting congregations, they're encouraging brothers and sisters. So sometime later, here we are in Acts 15, and the idea comes and Paul says, hey, why don't we go back and let's encourage all the churches where we've been? Which is fantastic. Every congregation needs encouragement and Paul and Barnabas were so well thought of, had planted congregations and these are the ones that they'll go and they'll encourage and everything was fine. They're spot on. Second missionary journey coming up. Paul and Barnabas, here we go. Until Barnabas says, I want to take John Mark. Paul said, I don't think so. You see, Paul's mentality was business as usual. I don't have time for this stuff. You say, what stuff? Well, in Acts 13, 13, John Mark had been with them on the first missionary journey, and he decided, hey, I'm going home, guys. I don't know if he was sick. I don't know if he was homesick. I don't know if he was thinking, ministry's not for me. I don't know where he was. But he left 
Barnabas and Paul on the first missionary journey. So second missionary journey rolls around, and Paul saying, uh, no, that's not a good idea. He's not going. So that's the dilemma. That's what creates the, the issue. What I want to do is share with you four positives in the midst of this very negative situation, okay? And hopefully train us to look for uh, the positives even in a negative situation. Even when you can't see and you're trying to preach, there's got to be a positive somewhere. Well, the first thing I want to bring out to you is they remain faithful to God. I'm sure this, was, this disagreement was discouraging to both Paul and Barnabas. Anytime you can't agree with a friend or a brother or a sister, it's frustrating. And as frustrated, as aggravated, as offended as they may have been, both of them remain faithful to God. So that's the first positive. They both remain faithful to God. Paul and Barnabas knew faithfulness to God mattered more than the argument. Sometimes I think we get it out of whack. And we think, i got to win this argument. i got to make sure I win the argument. i got to make sure I drive home my point here and that guy or that gal gets it. And Paul and Barnabas, they were, they were kind of in an impasse. I'm not going your way. You're obviously not going my way. We, we need to just divide up here and, and continue on. But we must stay faithful to God. Paul was concerned, and, and we're going to talk about this in our Bible class in just a little bit. In Philippians chapter 4, feel like a pirate. I need a patch. <laughs> Philippians 4. This has never happened before. So, Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, if he was talking to an individual or just the entire church, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul is concerned about two ladies who can't get along. The problem is sometimes the argument between brethren leads to one saying, fine, I'm done. And I'll leave. And they'll go to the other church in town. Or they won't go to any church. And they'll just quit God. And that's the sad reality of this. I don't think you, Odie and Syntyche, were arguing over doctrine. I think it was probably some opinion stuff. We don't know. If it was doctrinal, I think Paul would have let them, let them know. But the point is, he, he's so concerned about the issue in Philippians that he says, look, church, help them to get along. Help them to work this out. I want everybody to remain faithful to God. Someone gets their feelings hurt. Someone gets offended, and they quit the church. They quit God. Romans 14 and verse 1 says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not quarrel over opinions. Because you have opinions and I have opinions and you may disagree with my opinions and I may disagree with your opinions and guess what? It does not matter. To fellowship in the Lord, we don't have to agree on opinions. And it's a good thing or you know what? We would all be building our own little building somewhere. Because we don't agree on everything. Paul and Barnabas, they, they wanted to do the Lord's work. They wanted to do, uh, go on this second missionary journey. But they couldn't figure out how to make it happen together. So they, they have this difference of opinion, and that's what it was. Yet neither one of them quit the church or God. So even in the midst of this very negative situation, the positive is this, or one of the positives is this, they remain faithful to God. Discouraging, I'm sure it was, but not to the point they would quit God. Not to the point they'd stop doing what they were doing for the Lord. Let's move on. Secondly, the next positive I think we will draw is this. They continued the Lord's work. They continued the Lord's work. Verses 39 and following. I'm in Acts 15, our text. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Paul and Barnabas did. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas 
and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and went through Syria, Cilicia. So they continued the Lord's work. The main thing at the end of the day, if you and I agree or disagree, the main thing is that God's work continues. And they didn't allow. They could have been just fighting mad with each other. You say, well, you don't know if it was that serious. It was serious enough. They said, well, I'm not going with you. Well, I'm not going with you. It was serious enough they parted company. That's pretty serious for companions that have worked together for so long and done so much for the Lord. It was serious enough they parted company, but the Lord's work continued. Satan will do all he can to hinder and even destroy the Lord's work. That's what he wants to do. And if it's destroying us one by one or our families, one family unit at a time, that's what he'll do. Anything he can do to stop the Cabot congregation from reaching out, from focusing outward, to, to sending money to missionaries or, or doing whatever we do in this community, Satan will do what he can to hinder and destroy that. And the, the petty arguments, and when we turn inward and focus on our arguments, we're not focused on the Lord's work. So at some point, Paul and Barnabas say, fine, we'll split. We'll go our separate ways. But guess what? The Lord's work is going to continue. That's the positive. Even though they couldn't, they had this argument, they didn't stop God's work. They couldn't agree how to work together. So they just did the work separately. Barnabas goes one way, Paul another way, but they continue the Lord's work. When our disagreements, folks, listen, when our disagreements stop the Lord's work, we have become far too selfish. You know, every day there's something I have to remind myself. It's not about me. And you say, what? Nothing. We live in the me generation where everybody says, it's about me, it's my life, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to eat where I want to eat. I'm going to work where I want to work. I'm going to buy what I want to buy. It's all about me, and it's not. And if we can, to the younger generation coming along, drive that point home. Well, in all generations. When our disagreements stop God's work, we are selfish, period. Paul and Barnabas, no matter how angry they were with each other, they knew that it was not about them. This whole conversation began, this whole idea, this whole concept came about because of God's work and God's people. And that's what it's about, serving God, continuing His work. Thinking of one little congregation in Texas where the work stopped for a long time. And it did because there was such a... An uprising over, do, do, you, do you hang Christmas wreaths there and there? And, and this is not a joke. The work stopped. Elder meetings were completely overrun by Christmas wreaths. Did they hang or not? I'm serious. Because I was in the meetings. A congregational meeting on a Sunday night. Would you all come down here and let's all meet here after church tonight. We've got to talk about this. Do we put them up or do we not? And you say, well, just take them down if it's not that big a deal. I understand. But there, was this, there were people that were as much for it as there were against it. But what happened, let me tell you, the sad reality is this. The work stopped. Everything revolved around, well, do we put them up or do we take them down? How are we going to handle this? I'm thinking, January's here. We're, we're going to be done with this. No, we weren't done with it. It continued. That's what's discouraging. Satan was winning. That's what he wants. Let's talk about a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. And you say, well, that matters to me. That's your opinion. You say, well, it doesn't matter to me. That's your opinion. And and we can disagree on opinions all day, and it really doesn't make a difference. But what, what I can tell you this, we have to continue the Lord's work. And I can look back at that six months or however long it was, and I'm going, boy, Satan was loving that. You say, why Christmas Reese? It doesn't have to be Christmas Reese. It can be anything. Mike Singers, praise teams. I mean, we could go on and on. What time we have Bible class. Whatever. 
the, the, whatever it is that causes the disagreement that takes our focus from continuing the Lord's work. That's what Satan wants to do. And that's what Barnabas, and I want you to hear this, and Paul were too mature to allow it to happen. We can't agree. We can't continue the work together, so we'll continue the work separately. And they did. That's maturity. Well, it's immature that they were disagreeing. Really? You really think so? Because i got to be honest with you, friends. Sometimes I disagree with you. And you do with me. And I don't think that's immaturity. I think it's called a difference of opinion. And everybody's got one and it's all right. They remain faithful to God. That's the first positive. But the second positive, they continued the Lord's work. Man, that's great. I don't know why I'm looking at the clock because I can't see it anyway. <laughs> and thirdly, thirdly, they involved others in the Lord's work. Look at 39 and 40. So again, the sharp disagreement arose. They separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him, went to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and went through Syria and Cilicia. So they involved others in the Lord's work. Can't work together. But they recruited others. Why did they just go by themselves? Well, there's this example in Scripture of when God sent out, or when Jesus sent out in the limited commission, uh, Matthew 10, he sent them out in, in pairs. And I think that's such a good example. I mean, when our shepherds visit... Most of the time when I visit, there's somebody with me. The shepherd's in pairs most of the time. I just think that's wise. We have that biblical example anyway. So Paul and Barnabas, they cannot work together. They're not stopping the Lord's work. So they just enlist others to work with them. Barnabas the encourager, determined to give Mark a second chance. Here's my question. You look back in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4 verse 11. This is the end of Paul's life. But here, here's my question. If Barnabas doesn't take Mark and give him a second chance, does Paul write 2 Timothy 4 11? Near the end of his life, look what he says. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark. He's talking about John Mark. The very John Mark we're talking about here from Acts 15. And bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for my ministry. So if Barnabas caves and says, all right, Paul, I'll just, yeah, we'll just, we'll just forget about John Mark. Does Paul write that, that scripture several years later? Does, does John Mark become so discouraged that he says, I'll never do ministry, I'll quit? Does, is he faithful to God? I mean, there's so many questions that come up. But Barnabas, the encourager, he's such an encourager. He felt so strongly about encouraging this young man, giving him a second chance that he stood face to face, toe to toe with Paul, and he said, it, uh, I'm taking him. Either we bring him or we go separately. And, of course, that's the way it played out. And then we, as we read a minute ago, Paul believing Mark very useful to him in his latter life and his ministry. Paul chose to continue the Lord's work with Silas as his co-worker. Can you imagine, here's my question, can you imagine being trained or mentored by Paul or Barnabas? The things that they saw, one of the, my favorite things from school was just being in classes with missionaries and just hearing their stories. I mean, what, what they've encountered, what they've dealt with, what they've done, the, the baptisms and where they baptized them in a creek or someone standing there. I've told you stories of someone standing out in the water, hitting the water with a stick so that the alligators would stay away and they could baptize two or three people and get out of there. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, all these stories, though, that was the cool thing. Can, can you imagine the stories that Paul and Barnabas would have for Silas and for John Mark? Folks, we need to be mentoring and training others to be involved in the Lord's work. That's our job. And you say, well, buddy, you better get on it. That's what we're paying you for. I got news for you. That's your job too. We've got to train. We've got to mentor. If we're concerned about the church of tomorrow, you know what? That's our fault. That's on us. If we're worried about what's going to happen to the church, you know, when my grandkids come along, then you know what? That's on our shoulders. 
If we want the church to be strong, then the church must be strong now. And we better educate, we better train, we better mentor. And if we get lazy in that, the church will be weak. That's on us. That's on us. So if we want the church tomorrow to be strong, we better mentor. We better bring people along. We better have these classes like gold that are teaching these young ladies, these young girls what to do and how to serve and uh, all these different virtues that they're learning and are teaching the young boys how to stand in public and lead an assembly. Romans 12 talks about how we all have gifts talents. In verse 6 and following Romans 12, he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. His point is this. It's twofold. Number one, everybody has a gift. It drives me insane. I'll just be honest. When someone says, well, yeah, well, I'm not doing anything because I don't have a gift. So you're calling God a liar then, basically. Because God has gifted everybody with at least one gift. Now, some people are far more gifted, you know, And they can do a lot of different things. And maybe you can only do the one thing. Maybe your one thing is administration or whatever it is. But everybody has a gift. And the other thing is this. You figure out what your gift is and you use it for the church. You use it for the Lord. If it's taking care of the money and the finances or if it's calling the people that aren't here or sending cards or making visits or encouraging words or teaching, we could go on all day. But you find your gift and you use it. If it's mentoring the young girls or the young boys. You see such a negative situation in Acts 15. We've already drawn three positives from such a negative situation. Here these two good brothers have this fallen out to the point they split company. Well, they they both remain faithful. They both continued the Lord's work. And they trained others to be involved in the Lord's work. That's our job. That's our responsibility. Finally, maybe the most important of all, or well, they're all important. Verse 41, and and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So finally, the last positive in this negative ordeal, they strengthened churches. i got to be faithful. Got to continue in the Lord's work. I've got to be uh, involved in training and teaching others to be involved in the Lord's work. And folks, we better be about strengthening the church. Because if we're not about strengthening the church, are we, are we hurting the church? And if that's the case, God forbid. God forbid. Acts 15, 41, we saw this, this, whole, this whole thing plan in Acts 15 was about strengthening the church. Back in verse 36, he says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's, let's return and visit the brothers in every, every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. You know, this, this whole thing, let's go, let's go check on them. Let's go strengthen the congregations. Let's go encourage the, the brothers and sisters in Christ. The whole point was about strengthening the churches. That was their plan. They had different ideas how to go about it, but they still strengthened the church. And everything we do should be about strengthening the Lord's church. If it's a Saturday night game night, or if it's a fellowship meal potluck, or if we're fasting for the day, or if we're preparing for a 70th homecoming April the 15th, everything should be about strengthening the church. Because when we step outside those parameters, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if we're doing stuff that's not strengthening the church, it's obsolete. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It does not matter. 
Because everything we do should be somehow connected to strengthening the church. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, the context is the assembly here, which is fine. And Paul would say it like this, What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Let everything be done for the strengthening of the body. He would go on and he speaks. What's he talking about? Order. What if we just showed up? And Clay jumped up and, and led a song and I said, okay, well, I'm ready to preach now. And then we, we've still got an intercessory prayer. We've still got communion. It's just a, a, just a mixed match of whenever we get in there. It's just disorder and nobody's in, into it. There's no flow. And there's no strengthening of the body. You see, the order adds to building up and strengthening of the church. And that's why he brings this out in the, in the context of the assembly there in 1 Corinthians 14. It wasn't about, and I'm talking about then and it, it applies today. It wasn't about showcasing their spiritual gifts. Well, I can speak in tongues and I can, do, I, I can prophesy and I can interpret the tongues. It wasn't about showcasing their abilities that we don't have today. It was about strengthening the church. It was always about strengthening the church. Careful how you treat people. Careful how you speak to people. Because we want to strengthen the church. Wounding words tear down, they don't strengthen the church. If what you have to say is not going to build up and strengthen the church, then let me be honest with you. Don't say it. Don't say it. Why do you feel the need to say things that's not going to strengthen the church? Our words and our actions should strengthen the church. Man. I met this family and I tried so hard visit after visit, cards, whatever I could do to get them to come back to church. They came one time, long before I ever arrived in town. Came one time. This was many years ago. It was a whole story. But what happened was the, the morning that the husband, dad and mom get ready and they get their two little girls, their, their young uh, little girls ready, and they get them ready, and they, they send them off to Bible class, and they go to their class, and they get through worship. They're visitors. They know nothing. I mean, we, we've got to help the visitors to know where everything is and know what we're about and what we do. They thought things went well, and they go home, and they're excited. They've been to church that morning, and later that week, they get a letter in the mail. That dates the story for you. It wasn't an email. It wasn't a text. It was a letter. Do you remember those? Got a letter in the mail from a sweet little sister lady from the church that said, P.S., next time you come to church, put your girls in dresses. This dated years before I arrived to that town. The story was still being told, as you can imagine. I made visits to them, I developed a relationship with them, and guess how many times they came back? Not one single time. Now, is it that imperative that those little girls wear dresses? Is that strengthening the church? Now, what that does, let me, let me be frank with you before we quit. That's blacking the church's eyes, what that's doing. Because don't you think they told other people? Don't you think when they heard that someone attended there, oh, you go there? I mean, that, the best advertisement's word of mouth. Or the worst advertisement is word of mouth. However you want to look at it, right? Oh, what a horrible scar on the church because someone felt it so important that the girls wear, and I don't know what they were, they might have been wearing shorts, they might have been wearing jeans. I don't really don't care. They weren't wearing dresses, and it doesn't matter because now they don't, come, they don't go anywhere, and those girls are, are grown now, and they have kids of their own. They probably don't go to church anywhere. 
Everything we do needs to be about strengthening the Lord's church. That's the way Paul and Barnabas saw it. So they they remained faithful to God in the midst of their negative situation. They continued the Lord's work in the midst of their negative situation. If it's Christmas wreaths or the time of class or or evening worship or or something else that that distracts us and, and we disagree because you have one opinion and I have another opinion, our opinions really aren't that big a deal. As long as we continue the Lord's work, let's don't allow our opinions to distract us so much in this argument to be right that we forsake the Lord's work. They involved others in the Lord's work. Let's mentor, let's train, let's bring them along, and they strengthen the church. And folks, that's what we got to do. Some of you got little babies. Those of you with little babies are going to have grandbabies one day. What's the church going to be like then? Oh, I'm scared, I'm worried. Then let's get off of the seats and let's do what we can to strengthen the church today. Because if, if the church is strong today, and we're training, and we're mentoring the younger ones, the church will be strong then. And they'll do the same thing. We all go through negative situations. It's ironic that I would go through a negative situation on the morning I'm preaching about this. There's a positive. There are positives everywhere. No matter what your situation is, no matter if it's family-related, if it's work-related, whatever it is, there's always positives to draw from the negative situation. What kind of attitude, what kind of mindset do you have? Will you focus on the negative, crawl in a hole, develop a bad attitude? Or will you look for the positive? This morning, if you're subject to God's invitation, if we can help you in any way, we would encourage you to come. I probably will not see you, but we will have a shepherd up here that can see you. So we would encourage you to come if you have a need this morning, a physical need, a spiritual need. Together we stand and as we sing.